And I think the one big change is that over the last 10 years, we've seen that um, people need much more help with the specific vocabulary and skills for their particular job, their industry, their department, whatever. So the whole area has become much more specialized, or what's called English for specific purposes. So that's one big change. I think the other big change is that I've lost you now. Oh, there you are. The other big change, I think, is that when we started, we we followed a very traditional business English syllabus, which meant looking at individual tasks that people had to do, broken down into very traditional areas, like, for example, telephoning in English, giving a presentation, taking part in a meeting, taking part in a negotiation. Um, and I think we've we still cover those topics, but we've moved in a funny way, it sounds like a contradiction to what I said in the first point, but we've moved back to covering generic communication skills that you need whatever circumstance you're using business in English in. And these are the type of um, topics that um, Bob Dignan, who is one of our main authors, covers in the business skills section. And they're also the topics that we've, we've put together into this, in this collection um, in the book, there are, the, the chapters of the book are really is really a collection of articles from the business skills section of the magazine by Bob Dignan, which we've uh, adapted and uh, updated. So I think those are the two main changes. Okay, does that answer your question, Neil? Uh, you want the short answer or the long answer? Where's the short answer? Me. <laughs> okay, that's the short answer. I mean, the longer the longer answer is also kind of me, but actually, in a way, it was a very log logical development because since 1981, our company had published a general English magazine called Spotlight, which some of you might know, um, which I was involved in. Uh, from for about 1992 onwards. So actually, it, in a way, it was a very obvious and simple step to say, have a magazine for people who need English at work, because we knew that um, about half the people that were reading the general English magazine, actually the reason they were reading it was because they needed English for their studies, for their job, to get a better job, or... Um, you know, to prepare themselves to uh, go and work abroad using English. So, you know, like most new ideas, it's actually a, it's actually the final step is a very, is a very simple one, and it's, but it was really built up over a number of years where we saw that there was a, you know, people wanted more help with English for work at work. Yeah. Uh, now, um, I had prepared some questions that I was going to ask, but actually for the last uh, half an hour or so we've been uh, discussing the book and the group have come up with their own much better questions. <laughs> <laughs> That's always the thing. <laughs> so, um, and what we did was, uh, basically we, uh, I gave them the structure of your book, where it's divided into three uh, parts. And mm -hmm. uh, we've got some questions for each of those three parts. Is that okay? That's fine. Okay. Your picture's a little bit fuzzy now. It was very clear before. All right. Well, uh, if I'm in the picture, that's probably a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fire, fire All right, away. So we're going to start then. Uh, we're going to start with your, your picture's uh, your picture's fine. Uh, okay, great. Okay. And, I guess the audio is the most important thing, really, isn't it? So yeah, we're going to start I can hear you. The, the basics. And we've got a couple of questions uh, about the section that you call the basics. Um, who's... So, hello, I'm Simon, uh, and uh, we are interested in the question. Um, so, can you give us an example of how to deal with different, difficult people? Just one example, maybe, what is typical with, uh, to deal with. 
Okay, Simon, yeah. Have you, thanks for your question, because it's a very good one. Have you, um, I don't know if you've seen the chapter in the book about uh, dealing with difficult people. No. Have, no. have you had a chance to read it? No, no, just the structure. Okay, because the important point, I think the most important point that, um, that Bob Dignan brought out in his original article, and it made us all sit up and think in the office, was who is the difficult person? And the difficult person might be the person that you see in the mirror. So this was the, and again, this is kind of typical of the theme that runs through this book, is always, or not always, but often, to try to look at things in a different way. So if I'm talking to you and I'm finding you a very difficult person, uh, it may be that I first need to look at myself. I may be the difficult person. Um, and say so this comes up a number of times in, in, in the book. Um, it also comes up in a, in a later chapter on email. Uh, maybe I'll mention that later, the same, the same problem. So first thing is, if you're having a problem with communicating with somebody, Check whether it's not partly at least your responsibility. For example, if you find the other person boring, what, what are you doing to actually try to make it more interesting? Are you asking questions? Are you following up on things they're saying? Um, so in a sense, we're trying to get people to take more responsibility themselves for the success of the communication and not always pass the difficulties on to the other people. And that's why in the first section we concentrated on what really are the very basic skills, is how, how do you become a better listener, um, because that's the kind of the basis, and how do you also make sure that what you're saying is clear and transparent. So uh, Bob particularly is a very strong advocate of transparent c communication. You should be able to understand what, what I'm saying, and more importantly, why am I saying it? What do I want from you? So, I don't know if that answered your question, but... Yes, yes, interesting point of view, yep. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, then our second question um, is, uh, what is the best way to behave as a non-native speaker in a conversation with a native speaker? So we had an idea about to uh, maybe um, to behave like the native speaker, so maybe to um, speak in an uh, American way, or this idea is happy about this question. Yeah, so tell me, so tell me, what do you think? That was... Well, our uh, idea was that um, to, um, well, to be, uh, uh, to be honest and um, to be trustful and um, Really to stay in um, in his own um, skills, I think, to uh, to be a uh, yeah natural way and not to behave like the other person. Maybe it would be confusing for the. I think Oliver, do you want to add something? Is that right? Yeah. No, to keep your personality, yeah. not to adjust your personality um, to, to to behave like an American. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think you're. I think. I think you're right. I think there are. Again, I think it's. A, I think it's a balancing act. I think that often when we're with other people, we do actually adjust our behaviour slightly to fit in with them. And one thing actually that you can do to make other people like you or feel comfortable with you is, is actually to sort of copy little bits of their behavior, it's called mirroring. Um, but you can't, what you can't do and what you shouldn't try to do is, is to adjust your whole personality, your whole cultural background, for example. I mean, it, it becomes absurd when cult people try to adjust to each other from different cultures and then a British person starts trying to behave like a Japanese person, the Japanese person is trying to behave like a British person and no in the end nobody knows who they are. So I think fundamentally you, 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 know, you stay who you are, but observing the other person, the way they move, the way they uh, react to certain things, that's I think a very legitimate part of building 
a relationship or what we call rapport with somebody else. Um, it's just a question of how far you, you take that. But I think one or two other bits of advice, as, as you say, as a non-native speaker, is first relax. Take some deep breaths. For example, when you're on the, a lot of people panic when they have to speak on the phone in another language. The first thing they need to do is breathe. The second thing they need to do is remember, um, if you're speaking to an English person, for example, you're doing business with somebody from Britain, it is 99% certain that your English is a thousand times better than their German. I mean, there will be some exceptions, but normally you may be feeling unconfident because you're speaking in a foreign language, but you should actually, you already have the advantage because you're doing something that your business partner probably can't do. So you should actually be feeling good about yourself and, and confident and you shouldn't be, um, you know, worrying or thinking the other person is, is, is you know, like, a, like a, a, an examiner testing you for your, your grammar mistakes or something like that. You, I say, as I would think as a non-native advantage, you have a, a speaker, you have a huge advantage, particularly with Brits and Americans. I can't see her, that's the other thing. Oh, right, okay, let's see. All right, Where are... can you see Nina now? Which one is Nina? That's me. Okay, hi, I can see you All now, right. thanks. Okay, and let's put this a little bit closer to Nina, shall we? Look. Careful. I can see you now, Carl. Oh, <laughs> sorry about that. How's that? Okay, Nina? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't catch that. Um, how do you define trust in your book? Um, trust? Yes, and um, how is it connected to your relationship with it? Okay, I didn't catch the second part. The first part was about creating trust, is that right? Um, how do you define it? Oh, how do I define um, trust? Yeah, what does, it, uh, what does trust mean for you in this book? That's a good question. I don't know whether we did define it. That's a good point, actually. Yeah. While you're thinking about that, the second part was, um, so the first part is how do you define it in your book, um, what's your concept of trust, if you like, and how is it connected to relationship building? Okay. Okay. Um, well, the, the, the point of the trust is, in one level it's quite difficult to define, but trust is about interdependence, um, and it's about feeling confident that somebody else will uh, do the things that they are supposed to do and say they do. So the classic example is when you get into an aeroplane, whether you think about it consciously or not, you probably trust the pilot. You believe, think this person has the skills, has the qualifications, and that he or she is going gonna, is gonna to do the job properly. So it's all about, trust is about belief that you can have confidence and your expectations in the other person will be met.